Did you know the primary language that you learn as a child determines how easy or how hard it is for you to learn to hear and speak other languages? Not everybody knows that. It's true. And it comes down to frequencies. So we're going to go over several things, how music is improving your language and it does it through frequencies and frequency acquisition. So different languages contain a different set of frequencies. They're not all the same. So your native language that you hear and speak has a lot to do with your ability to hear frequencies and therefore speak and learn other languages for the rest of your life. Music and art are going so far down the list as priority, priorities in education, and we keep getting worse and worse and worse in math and science, and people are so confused as to why. Well, I mean, one of the big reasons is because we keep removing math, uh, music. So math always gets worse because music makes you smarter in math, <laughs> as well as in reading, as well as in everything else. But when you look for a sound system, if some of you, this has been around for decades, tomatoes based sound healing therapies, you really, 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 really want a system that uses bone conduction, meaning you'll have a headset that has a special uh, device inside that's been specially made that will sit and contact the skull and create bone conduction that rides through the skull and actually will be stimulating cranial nerve 10 called the vagus nerve. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of what that's all about and why. Um, and again, I'm gonna be I'm recording the Zoom. So sometimes I'm gonna look here, sometimes I'm gonna look there. So again, check out the um, parts one and two. I kind of explained how the ear can therefore be used to decrease overwhelm and stress as well as improve reading and writing. So thereby helping to eliminate those pesky diagnoses such as anxiety, ADHD, dyslexia, and a whole host of other things, okay? Definitely think auditory processing disorder, things like that. Kids that seem rigid, stuck, easily overwhelmed, not resilient neurologically. There's, there's a reason. And here's a therapy that's easy that you can do at home with them in the in the comfort of walking up in the backyard playing catch and things okay believe it or not um so what we've discovered is that you know short recap is that by using music with a very wide very wide range of frequency and then specifically enhancing certain frequencies this music is compressed we can basically say the music's got this much frequency and we can say okay well this brain is struggling with these frequencies so the music is compressed with only these frequencies to stimulate and feed so much sound nutrition of those frequencies that go to certain parts of the brain that need it. If they're missing these frequencies, that goes to a different part of the brain and they have a very different function. But let me explain something to you with all these frequencies, okay? From low to high frequencies, that's what's going on, low to high, I mean, we could do it like that. Different parts of these frequency bandwidths do different things and they have like different tasks associated with them. But let me be real clear. I can't go up here trying to fix an issue here if I'm missing all of this. You got to start from the bottom and work your way up. And we'll explain a little bit of that. All right. So we're helping um, increase the brain's ability to improve its language centers by increasing its ability to hear all these frequencies of language, plus a whole lot more particularly with that bone conduction that is stimulating the vagus nerve, which is the most powerful, soothing, calming, rest and digest, digest part of your nervous system, the parasympathetic. Okay. I should have brought, I do have some water. All right. So here's a little story, sort of a story, kind of a fact that a lot of people, lesser known brain fact, right? Did you know, you can drop it down in the comments that the vocal cords, right? My vocal cords can only make the sounds that when I developed that my ears could hear and therefore my brain could understand, all right? That becomes important in learning. And therefore, because of that, did you know the primary language that you learn as a child determines how easy or how hard it is for you to learn to hear and speak other languages. Not everybody knows that. 
It's true. And it comes down to frequencies. So we're going to go over several things, how music is improving your language, and it does it through frequencies and frequency acquisition. So different languages contain a different set of frequencies. They're not all the same. So your native language that you hear and speak has a lot to do with your ability to hear frequencies and therefore speak and learn other languages for the rest of your life. Uh, so some of the most limited languages in frequency. So where we are, like all the frequencies, some languages are very limited in where they are and what you hear and speak. Some of the most limited are the Asian languages. And, um, you know, Korean is renowned for this. So, and then one with the highest frequency ranges is Dutch. So if you started off learning Korean, you have a harder time for the rest of your life being able to hear and then pronounce certain sounds. Hence why somebody can live in an English speaking country and speak very well English for 20, 30 years, but they still can, if they're Korean, they can't ever make that R sound because their brain never had that information up here to be able to do it. And now they can't neurologically, all right? Dutch native speakers, however, almost every single Dutch person I've ever met in real life and one of my exes was half Dutch, like father from there. So spoke that, uh, spoke 12 languages, very common for them to speak five to six languages. Every single Dutch person I've ever met speaks at least six languages to speak eight to 10 is like, they all can do it. And everybody thinks they're so smart. I'm not saying they're not smart. However, it's very easy. That's been, this has been proven for Dutch native speakers to speak a whole bunch of languages. They can hear so many more frequencies than somebody let's say that started with Korean. All right. So uh, maybe not something you didn't know, because again, if you can't, if you can't hear the English letter R, like Korean doesn't have that sound, they can never say it. Right. So there, there's a reason for it. Um, all right. So frequency by listening to this therapy, you open up frequencies of what the hear, the ear and the brain can hear. That's critical for language. Another thing that children and adults will learn, especially children, is prosody. Um, that's changes in intonation. Okay, so when that's that prosody is contained within music and it's required in language. Um, missing prosody, especially in language, leads to major errors in understanding the meaning behind what someone is saying based upon tone. Okay, if you can't get that part right of tone and what that meaning will mean, you will usually have a very socially inappropriate response to what someone is saying, because you've just totally missed the meaning. So this is classic. This is a hallmark of, let's say, autism spectrum disorders, missing. So the ear is unable to pick up the changes in, in prosody, can't pick up those tonal changes. So that child cannot tell the difference between, pick up your backpack, pick up your backpack, pick up your backpack. It all sounds like pick up your backpack, pick up your backpack. That, that's all they hear. They can't tell if someone's mad. They can't tell if someone's glad. They can't tell what's happening. It's all the same. We have a lot of social errors because of the inability to pick up prosody. This can help reinstill that in a child's ear and brain. Also critical to language is sequencing of sounds, right? That's obviously necessary to learn to read, right? And, and it's embedded with, within the music naturally. So it helps the ear and the brain learn to do this with almost, with almost like no effort. No child has to struggle because it's just taught and they can pick up sequences of sounds when they finally get to letters and having to read. Fluctuations in tempo and rhythm, again, is incredibly critical to learning language and the music helps the brain learn to do this. It's one of the reasons that nursery rhyming and poetry have been long traditions for children. Why some of these things have persisted is because the sing song nature of them helps make brighter brains. So if you aren't reading and singing rhymes and poems to your kids, start now. That should be the first thing they're actually learning to hear from you, poems, right? It, it's, there's a reason that sing song happens because you're teaching um, 
you know, fluctuations, tempo and rhythm. All right. So music is supportive in enhancing all four of these aspects of language, right? Fluctuations, tempo and rhythm, sequencing of sounds, prosody and frequency. Um, all right. So that's just what the brain aspects are. I'm going to switch gears a little bit because again, I'm going to talk about sound devices that are using bone conduction. I mentioned it, you know, we want bone conduction coming through here. So like, it doesn't work if it's like this, <laughs> okay? It doesn't work all the way. It works a little bit if it's like this. I need the bone conduction touching the head, all right? I need that there, all right? Because through this bone conduction, conduction that's where we have a, a really strong, powerful ability to stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Um, take it out there. Ugh. Can't hear myself real well. Bone conduction of sound is something we really have all experienced. So imagine um, that time when you kind of, many of us, we felt the music. We felt usually deep bass of some rhythmical drumming or a very loud subwoofer playing usually like rap songs have a lot of that. And you'll just feel it through your bones. Um, and the reason you can feel it and hear it is because the sound travels uh, through the bones and it activates um, these this little bone set inside your ears that you guys might remember the, the malleus, incus, and stapes, basically like a little drum and hammer set. Okay. You guys all probably had that, you know, way back in like sixth grade biology or something, <laughs> right? Um, to understand really the power of bone conduction, um, I'm going to return briefly to the polyvagal theory that I mentioned in one of the other videos, which is basically the science of feeling safe. Okay. That's what polyvagal theory really is about. It's like a theory about how the vagus system and, and multiple innervations lead to, we're always seeking safety first and foremost. If you can't do that, nothing else matters. Um, at its core is the biological fact of neuroception which is the concept that um, the neuro neurological lens that we have all over our body, we have many, many ways of assessing this is basically we're constantly assessing our environment through neuroception and we're responding to it optimally, right? That's what we're trying to do. So neuroception and polyvagal theory are all about the body's attempt to feel safe, um, you know, better and less overwhelmed, right? at what it's looking for and does it, it's designed to do it at all costs. That's what it's gonna do no matter what. So that's its main priority. Like, so that's what your kids' bodies are doing and what you're maybe asking them to do is going against what their body is telling you. So maybe they're not oppositional. Maybe they're just like, their nervous system's like, I'm not doing that. Like, are she nuts? We're, no. And that's all they know to do is stop moving or tell you no, or just look resistant and defiant. But it's really, polyvagal theory and neuroception at play, showing you that the nervous system is out of control, right? So the, the, the parasympathetic nervous system, the PNS, is controlled by the vagus nerve, which I've said several times. Um, and it's that's what gives us a sense of calm. It's a lovely state, right? Um, the sympathetic nervous system is a part of the nervous system that should activate and override the parasympathetic nervous system um, only in times of feeling threatened or in danger, right? Ideally, that should be rigorously and very short-lived. Again, think of a fight, think of a war, think of running away from a lion. All of these things are highly explosive, amping you up for a burst of act physical activity where you're either winning and it's over or you lost and you're dead. Doesn't need to take a whole lot. 20 minutes is way too long to be stressed. Okay. It's giving, it's like 20, 30 seconds usually, two minutes tops because you either want it or you didn't. Okay. You got away or you're done and, and all the pain is over. Right. But something people don't seem to understand or don't know and aren't taught is that listening is controlled by the vagus nerve. All right. So what you hear and how you hear it influences how your body responds. It's part of the neuroception. So the best therapeutic listening systems, this is a therapeutic listening system, um, must include bone conduction. So it's creating a stronger parasympathetic nervous system activation. And that creates what we call a sense of embodiment. That word I think is really important. People, we use words like grounded, right? Or being present, mindfulness, but that's embodiment, especially for a child 
who's really being scared and all over the place that lets them get grounded and in their body they can they, it's an embodiment right of what's happening so bone conduction um, is what gives that state by activating the vagus uh, nerve. It also stimulates inside the ear, a thing called the vestibular cochlear system. Um, and that's inside the, inside the brain. And it's like the snail like circular vortex. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of a magical thing that it's inside this, but this is like a, a part of the brain ear mechanism that gives you a sense of where you are in space. And then that vestibular cochlear system um, connects to, it goes to every single muscle in your body, right? Because it's there to sense what is going on. This is why we're going to go back to this. This is where we go back to remembering body organization. Remember I mentioned body organization in the other videos and that it was the foundation of all higher learning and cognition, like focus and attention, concentration, impulse control all the things everybody wants their kids to have, all the things the kids are lacking, all the things the kids are being diagnosed for, and all the things that kids are being prescribed stimulant addictive medications instead of anybody addressing body organization, instead of anybody addressing auditory processing, how the ear is hearing, instead of anybody addressing vagal stimulation, right? Nobody's addressing frequency, prosody, uh, can they hear tone? Are they missing it? Can they, you know, that kind of thing, right? So this is where, you know, maybe my soapbox is a little bit is that, you know, we're really expecting children to possess these capabilities, these higher functioning uh, capabilities when we have set them up neurologically with very poor and uncoordinated body coordination through lack of movement, lack of muscle strength, lack of balance, lack of coordination, and a very increased sense of detachment and dissociation from their bodies, right? Because we've increased lack of movement. We've removed hard physical work from children, right? How many are growing up on farms? How, how many even carry groceries in, right? Nobody's digging ditches anymore. Um, and we've immersed them and their minds into digital worlds of incredibly abnormal visual, visual cues and light fr flickers from screens that are missing frequencies from the lack of human voices in their lives. Many people don't even read books to their kids anymore. Their kids are just listening to them on, on tape, right? They're just listening to audiobooks. Well, that does not replace what a human voice has. You are missing a tremendous amount of frequencies by putting it down into a digital compression, right? So these digital sounds of movies and YouTubes, videos, and even audiobooks are are damaging the ability of the ear and the brain to hear all the frequencies and intonation that they're supposed to be hearing. And it leads to the poor body organization I've talked about, right? So my suggestion is that bringing bone conduction through an, uh, a therapeutic listening device in particular back into to the kids lives that are missing this you know in a therapeutic way coupled with some very specific brain exercises based on all on movement and, and having fun um, it creates an access point to embodiment and body organization right that through this very strong activation of the parasympathetic nervous system and vestibular cochlear system right? In, in one, in one area to increase embodiment, body organization and decrease anxiety and stress and overwhelm. Right. So my assessment, what I've been saying for a very long time to parents, when they come in for like tutoring or this or that program is I'm like, look, your kids, our kids, our, our children of the world and America, I d definitely know for sure. They don't need any more testing. They don't need any more drills. They don't need any more worksheets, right? They need an education based upon decades of proven research, which shows the neuroscience of human brain development. So we're asking our kids to do things that they are incapable of neurologically, right? And then we're labeling them with a disorder from the bad setup we gave them from what we've done. So. With that disorder comes all these prescribed therapies and treatments and drugs to, you know, fix them. When in reality, it's really been our lack of understanding and prioritizing neurology that is at the heart of the problem. 
we're doing it and we need to take it back, learn more and do, do better. All right. So the schools are wrong. And I really don't want to see the homeschool communities just starting to repeat the same bad practices, especially the families doing it relatively alone. Many of you are doing this for the first time and I get it. I applaud you for saying I will not be, I will not be party to this. I will hold my kids to this, but I want to help you. I want to help you, you have more fun and get better results and have these kids be happier. Okay. By going after them neurologically. So um, if you can start to learn more about the neurology of learning, and I'm trying to give it to you here, um, you can really save you and your kids a ton of heartache and stress. Absolutely. So, you know, your kids, here's a couple other things. Nope. Your kids do not need to be able to read by the first grade, nor even by the second grade. Nah, no, it's, it's, it's a scam that they're trying to do this early reading, right? If kids t teach themselves, great. It's complete nonsense the way they're trying to force this upon brains, though, that are not neurologically ready. So in fact, you know, really by forcing so many of these kids to try and read before they're ready, we're creating disordered brain adaptions and that's getting hardwired in their brains. It's, it's setting them up to struggle for the rest of their lives, actually. Um, so here's a reading tip because this device is really all about improving reading and dyslexia and things like that. Uh, typically in practice, the way I've always done it is I have to make parents agree. I'm like, there's no tutoring, there's no homework, there's no more nothing. And so often it's done on a summer program. Like you have to just trust me. They take a big risk because this sounds crazy because aren't I supposed to send them to like a special reading school? Aren't they supposed to be tutoring? Aren't supposed to be doing like Kumon type stuff all summer long? I'm like, nope, we're, we're just going to go after it neurologically. And they're like, they're going to put this thing on, listen to music and like play bean bags and catch and balance boards and do jumping jacks and push ups like for an hour a day. And that's it. I'm like, yeah, that's it. Then they're going to go play, go swim, go climb trees, no worksheets, none of it, none of it, mama, please trust me. Trust me. Here's the studies. I'll prove it to you what they've been doing. Sorry, your school's too dumb to understand to read science, but let me explain it to you. Okay. I can't, I can't talk about the schools. I don't, I don't understand that they don't know how to read apparently. So here's your reading tip. If you, these are my, these are kind of my three rules. I'm like, so here's the thing. If your kid can't tie your, their shoes by themselves, cross lateral skip. Like, so if you're, if you're my age, if you're like 15 up, y'all know what skipping is. A lot of kids don't know what skipping is. They don't know how, cause they can't do it. They're so discoordinated, right? Their body organization is so bad. They don't know how to do it. Tie your shoes takes cross lateral movement, takes left and right brain communication, nice corpus callosum. It takes a lot to be able to do that. Got to be able to skip properly and ride a bike. If they can't do those three things, you shouldn't be trying to make them read. Don't force it. Okay. Because this is where I start. So oh, you can't do that. We're done. This is what I focus on with my kids and my patients. And let me tell you the joy I get for when a kid can tie their Dr. Ramka. They show me they tie your shoes, Dr. Remka, and we skip in my parking lot. And let me tell you what happens when they bring a bike. And I've got an eight, nine, 10, 11 year old that can finally ride a bike. I said, now we're ready to hit that other stuff and believe and and look, all of a sudden, after three months of, of listening therapy and not doing any worksheets and not doing anything else. Oh, look, Miles can suddenly read three, three grade school levels higher. Huh? magic and he wasn't miserable doing stupid stuff and mom didn't have to be a school teacher okay so why does that happen this is a little bit of a longer one. Oh, i gotta go on and do another thing i'm gonna finish it so basically this goes back to a bottoms up neurological solution to learning right and i talked about these frequencies and how i gotta start from the bottom work my way up um this was developed in learning by william and, and, and schallenberger and it has seven basically based upon seven sensory inputs at the base of all learning for the central nervous system for your brain and, and your spinal cord it's tactile vestibular proprioception uh, are the kind of the base foundation that's all based on movement y'all that's kids got to play. They got to move. You don't learn this sitting in a desk. You don't learn it sitting in front of a holding a Kindle and an iPad. You don't learn it watching TV. You don't learn it at a computer. Get them up and out of your house. They have to move. Please 
foundation of all central nervous system learning. Then we have olfactory, visual, auditory, and gustatory on top of it. That's the foundation before I can even ever address uh, sensory motor stuff, such as awareness of two sides of the body or motor planning or postural security. Everybody wants to go to these higher level things and we haven't even done down here. That's a real big problem. So that's incredibly far removed from eye-hand coordination and attention centers. Yeah, that's all they go after in academic environments, right? Through testing, testing, testing. So our entire approach is, is, isn't based upon any neuroscience. It's all, right? But we can easily change that. Parents can learn this and change the home, the yard, and the routine to build a very strong body organization by feeding the seven sensory inputs first. First, I do understand mama and, and papa. That means you got to get off your butt. You're going to have to move. You are going to have to put the computer down. You're going to have to put the phone down. You're going to have to disconnect and actually engage. It's, it's, yeah, it's a thing. It's, it's actually fun. Kids are a riot. If you actually play with them, get on, get on the ground with them, play with them. It's, it's awesome. Okay. So if you're interested in this system, go ahead and send me a message via email to desk at Dr. Um, and ask about integrated listening system. Um, we're, you can rent it monthly. You can buy it yourself. Um, I'll help you figure out which one makes the most sense for you and your situation. Some people it's really better to have it. A typical program takes it about at least three months to be prepared for that. Um, it looks like 30 to 60 minutes of listening music, playing catch and some games. I do want parental interaction. It's always great if you have two, three kids and you have many of all of them wearing at the same time and playing together, bang it out. It's really awesome to do it that way. Many kids um, will repeat the same program three to four times a year. If you're like on the autism spectrum, we've got something really big going on. So just be prepared for that. Um, so that case to rent to your own, rent your own might be a good option. Um, I have units that I rent out just, I'm keeping those restricted to Atlanta kind of area, Atlanta, Athens, you know, you can get to me, we can do it. Um, incredibly affordable, believe it or not. I'm not going to drop prices on this, but I'm practically giving mine away because um, and my heart is breaking at watching what I'm seeing and uh, your children need help. So I'm here. It does help adults too, right? 